What is up, everybody? Welcome to the first episode of Marvel Standom Live. I am your host with the least, Mike Cicchini, and with me for all time and always, I have Den of Geek News and Features Editor, Kirsten Howard, and I have Den of Geek TV Editors, Alec Bajalid and Katie Burt. And we are here to talk about that Moon Knight trailer, folks. But first, it's been kind of an interesting week or so for the MCU and for the Marvel Universe in general. Uh, so we just want to get you caught up on a couple of cool things that uh, have caught our attention at Denny Geek and at Marvel Standom. First of all, if you are not familiar with our web home of denofgeek.com, you should familiarize yourself with that URL and start hanging out there and checking out our coverage. Because right now, today, just moments ago, we dropped an exclusive Marvel Comics announcement for Spider-Verse fans. Spider-Punk is getting his own limited series from amazing Spider-Man writer Cody Ziegler and artist Justin Mason. And we have the first look at that book. And we have the first ever uh, interview with Cody Ziegler about it. And if you don't know Cody Ziegler, Cody has been doing some really cool work on the Amazing Spider-Man title, which is awesome at the moment. Ben Riley is back working for the Beyond Corporation from Next Wave. It's really cool. So now that Cody is getting to explore the Spider-Verse with Spider-Punk, a fan favorite character that was created a couple years ago, this looks like it's going to be a good time. So go check that out. All of our Marvel coverage is at denigeek.com slash Marvel. This is going to be the first series. That, this is going to be the first story that you see there. The other big thing that happened recently is Eternals has landed on Disney Plus as of last Tuesday. So I got to say, if any of you saw our Marvel standup episode back in November, you'll know that I was a little bit harsh on Eternals. It doesn't hold together. These characters are not very compelling. The script is just boatloads of brutal exposition, really wooden performances. The movie's at its best when it's not doing superhero scale action, because when it is, it looks terrible. I got, uh, I got more out of it this time, and uh, I still think it's a pretty flawed film, but you know, Mia culpa. Maybe I just wasn't in the right frame of mind the first time I watched it. Uh, you know, it's interesting. It's ambitious. There's still, you know, things that I have issues with. But, um, you know, based on uh, based on my second viewing, I thought it had a lot more to say. I thought it was a lot more interesting. I got more out of the performances. Um, and based on what we're seeing on Den of Geek with engagement on the articles that we published back in November, it looks like it has found a new audience on Disney+. Plus. Did anybody else here uh, give themselves a second viewing of Eternal since it landed on streaming? I haven't rewatched it yet, but I actually really liked it, um, I think, a lot more than you did the first time, Mike. So I'm looking forward to, to watching it again. What were the things that struck you as different this time? Or what, what do you think made you like it this time more than the first? I don't know. Maybe it's because I... Um... I had a different set of expectations this time mm. around. You know, I never expected this to be like the Jack Kirby comics. Like I always knew like any good adaptation is going to make changes. And Eternals is such a bizarre concept that it isn't something that is naturally going to work as a movie. So I kind of had a better idea of what I was getting into. Um, but you know what? I was really rough on some of the performances when we first talked about this movie. I remember. <laughs> and, and, you know what? And a lot of them worked. A lot of them worked a little bit better. Like in particular, like the the romance between uh, Druig and Makari was mm. something that like just did not land for me at all the first time. Like I really just kind of glossed over it. Uh, to quote Kingo, you know, I hate it. And this time around, not only did I enjoy it, I was really moved and impressed by how completely natural it felt between them. You know, there were all kinds of like cool background details as well that I didn't notice the first time. Um, look, it's still a movie that has issues, but I no longer see this as kind of like a lower tier Marvel movie that I'm not in a hurry to revisit. I think there's more to get out of this. There is, I actually do want to spend time with these characters again, which I did not necessarily want before. Um, so it was really good. But I'll tell you what really made a difference for me. <laughs> yes. Um, was an amazing article by our own Kirsten Howard, which landed on Linda Geek just in time for that streaming launch that says unequivocally that Eternals benefits from a second viewing. And you should definitely go to denigeek.com slash Marvel 
or denageek.com slash Eternals and check out Kirsten's article. Don't do this if you have not watched the movie yet because it is full of spoilers. Um, but it's a really good time. And if you're kind of on the fence about this movie and you're looking for something to kind of give you an excuse to give it a second chance, check this out. Give it a look. Let us know whether you agree or you disagree. I agree, Kirsty, for the record. Well, thank you. <laughs> I give it my best shot to uh, get you watching it a second time. Not that I didn't enjoy it the first time, I did, but I found the second time an easier watch. One other cool thing we got going, and this is just an excuse for us to remind you to be following us on social. Make sure you're following our web home on Twitter at Geek US. We're also at Marvel Standom on Twitter. But we are running an MCU bracket tournament at the moment. So make sure you make your voice heard there. It's called Marvel Mania. We are currently, uh, we're well into this, by the way. There's only a couple rounds left, and we just launched another round today. So make sure you go vote for your favorites there. Uh, the current matchups are... Avengers Endgame versus Spider-Man Homecoming. These are two awesome movies, but unfortunately, I uh, I think I have a feeling about which one is going to come out on top there. Um, if you ask me to choose between those, it would be a pretty tough one. Uh, Guardians of the Galaxy Volume 1 versus Civil War. Iron Man 1 versus Infinity War. And Spider-Man No Way Home versus Thor Ragnarok. So these are four tough choices here, folks. We are not going to try to influence the audience vote with our own opinions this time. It's really hard to resist. (laughs) It is hard to resist. Um, But make sure you go over to uh, at Den of Geek US on Twitter and uh, vote. And all of the votes that we are accumulating for this, all of the audience votes are going to feed into our comprehensive Den of Geek and Marvel Standom MCU ranking, which is coming in a couple of weeks. So your voice on this matters. This is going to help us assemble our master ranking of every MCU film. We're going to do the TV shows another time, folks. Help us craft that master list, and we will reveal that countdown on a future episode of Marvel Standom Live. Are these episodes or issues, folks? Are we calling these episodes of Marvel Standom Live or issues of Marvel Standom Live? What do you think? I mean, I'm a TV editor, so everything. Yeah, same. (laughs) Episodes. I don't know. Uh, Kirsty and I are the only comic book loyalists, and even she doesn't like issues. All right, I'm outvoted, folks. That's it. (laughs) Let the audience have something to say. (laughs) We're here to talk about Moon Knight, though. Like, unquestionably, the biggest thing to hit Marvel in the last week is that Moon Knight trailer, which dropped the night of a full moon uh, during an NFL playoff game, and I have to appreciate that. Something tells me that it was more important that they get this out during halftime of an of an NFL wildcard game than, uh, you know, than the fact that it was a full moon was more of a coincidence. But, you know, I like this kind of thing. Hello. Hello. So we can watch the Canonically a Rubik's Cuber. I can't tell the difference. Actually better, perhaps, that... <laughs> Yeah, I was going to ask, did anyone want to do, or did anyone want to try a British accent over this trailer? God, no. <laughs> <laughs> so we can get the flavor of it, you know. I feel like you would never speak to me again if I tried my British accent. <laughs> I'd love to hear it. I simply would. Please, go ahead. Did we know that the series was set in London before... I mean, yeah. When did we find that out? If it is, if it is set in London, (laughs) I guess it's set in his brain or something. (laughs) I like how creepy this trailer is. Yes, we're we're gonna talk about the creepy vibes in a little bit because that is like the thing that I find the coolest and most interesting about Moon Knight. So I hope it's exciting. Why did you Why call, did you me, call Mark? me Mark? <laughs> <laughs> what are you call me Mark, Governor? He went we for go. it. <laughs> He's a Victorian chimney sweep. I see House of Newton is uh, having a little fun with Oscar's <laughs> accent over in the chat. But House of Newton, we see you. We know what a we know what an Oscar Isaac standing for. <laughs> Uh-oh. We're going to talk about that shot because that is really badass, and, and they changed it from the original teaser footage as well. So. As someone who knew nothing about Moon Knight before this trailer, I love, I love the costume. It's also nice just to see a Marvel he- hero just 
beating the ever loving shit out of somebody just like <laughs> yes. like they're pu- like punching like with like sledgehammers you can almost hear them breathing so hard he's putting so much effort behind the punches yes. <laughs> so it's a very moon knight fighting style as well which i'm sure we'll get into but yeah brutal justice folks as usual i have done all the talking for the first part of this show however what you all need to know is that the moon knight expert on the marvel standing team it ain't me, folks. It's Kirsten Howard, and this is Kirsty's show. So, <laughs> Kirsty, why don't you lead us into some discussion about what everybody needs to know about Moon Knight? Okay, well, uh, the first thing that you probably should know about Moon Knight is that he has dissociative identity disorder, which means that he has uh, quite a few identities inside him. But the central one is Mark Spector, He was a former Marine and worked for the CIA for a spell and then became a quite deadly mercenary. Um, After a raid gone wrong in the desert turned him against his partner Bushman, uh, Bushman killed him and he was revived by the moon god Khonshu in exchange for becoming his avatar on Earth. And ever since, Mark has dished out often, you know, hardcore vigilante justice on the streets mostly at night but that tends to change with whatever the story is <laughs> yeah it's a it's a great comic um he's a great comic character rather and if you are just thinking about getting into the comics we'll have some more of that for you later um but the tv series has been quite different um Ma- and mike you're familiar with moon knight as well what what are the main differences that you've seen between the comic and the and the tv show so far I mean, obviously that uh, that accent is something, but there there is there does seem to be a cool in story reason for that. So we'll talk about it. But one thing that jumped out at me is it seems that Mark Spector kind of powers up, and that the Moon Knight uh, costume like assembles around him. It's like a magical thing, which is not really the case in the comics. Like in the comics, uh, Mark is the fist of Khonshu, right? He's basically a priest of this uh, this. Egyptian moon god. I don't even, you know what? I should know this, but I'm pretty sure that Khonshu is not an actual figure from uh, Egyptian religion and mythology. Um, but the idea there is that Mark is, uh, he's a priest. You know, he is like, he is Khonshu's like avatar on earth. So he puts this costume on, but it is, you know, he considers it like kind of like his, his like holy vestments. Um, but that shot in the trailer it's like it's almost like he becomes possessed and that's where the costume powers up from which is a neat take i don't know if i love it but it's interesting the costume looks awesome in this though i think something that we should also note is that we don't meet the actual central uh, character of mark specter in this trailer we meet one of his alternate identities stephen grant in the comics, he's kind of a millionaire, sorry, a millionaire playboy who finances Moon Knight's sort of vigilante justice. But here, he seems to be just a kind of a humble gift shop employee, and he's British. And we've had, <laughs> we've had a lot of comments about that accent that Oscar Isaac is doing. Um, but I think it might be a case of it being on purpose. Um, Marvel recently uh, released a trailer reaction featuring Oscar Isaac and Ethan Hawke in which Oscar Isaac seems to be making fun of that accent a little bit. So I think it is on purpose. Mark Spector isn't British, but the fact that one of his alternate personalities thinks he is um, (laughs) (laughs) means that he, of course, is doing a terrible British accent. So um, I think we're going to see that make a lot more sense in the show. I will add to that that Oscar Isaac went to Juilliard and I feel like not that you have to graduate or come out of Juilliard with the perfect accent ability, um, but I feel like you have to be above Dick Van Dyke. And he's done accents before in other movies and been very good at them. So yeah, as I as someone who didn't know anything about the character um, until recently, um, yeah, as soon as I saw your comment, Kirsty, that this was probably intentional, I was like, yeah, that that makes sense. That checks out. 
I'm filing above Dick Van Dyke away <laughs> for future reference when we discuss accents. Please uh, do. What, like someone on Twitter, someone on Twitter called him uh, Dick Van Dameron, which I thought was quite funny. <laughs> Clever. One quick note from the chat: Lee Parham, uh, our social media coordinator at Den of Geek, is moderating our chat today, and he just corrected me about Kanshu. He says spelled slightly different, but there is an Egyptian god named Kansu. So, Lee, question for you. You know, you can just do this <laughs> while we get on to our next point. Is Kansu a moon god in official Egyptian religion? Help me out here so I don't look like a jerk. Thank you so much. Uh, I will say that generally, I don't know if Marvel or I don't know if this is where you want to go for Egyptian history. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, like, Who knows? <laughs> you also really seem like concerned about an ancient Egyptian backlash coming at you. <laughs> Look, all I need in my life is a curse put on me right now. That's like all I need, you know, with everything else going on. Come on, folks. Sorry, Kirsty, I didn't mean to throw your rhythm off there. So uh, Stephen Grant is a gift shop employee, works in a uh, London museum with a sleep disorder. We get a hint of Mark in the trailer when he gets a phone call for Mark, but doesn't really understand what's happening. There's another identity who we don't get any kind of hint of in the trailer called uh, Jake. He is a New York cabbie in the comics who has his ear to the ground for any information on street level for Mark. But yeah, nothing of Jake yet. So um, we do see Konshu, the moon god, in the trailer. Um, he looks really cool. So I'm glad, I'm really looking forward to seeing more of him in the actual show. Um, I was, in doing my basic research uh, about this character, I was excited to see that one of his abilities listed on the Marvel wiki was a knowledge of, like, the New York uh, cityscape and streets because of his history, Jake's history, I guess, as a as a cabbie. I was like, I really hope that comes into play. As someone who watched The Night Manager and was hoping that the climax would be Tom Hiddleston, like, using his hotel man managerial skill set to, like, somehow... <laughs> you know win the day um and that didn't happen so i'm keeping my fingers crossed for moon night <laughs> question about kansu um <laughs> i pronounced wrong is is that who i'm looking at right now is that, that the monster that approaches him in the elevator that is Konshu, yes the moon god who her, who mark has a psychic connection with in the comics um yeah, we don't get a lot of him, but that is very bang on with the comics version of Conchu. I can't believe you didn't recognize him, Alec. I know, yes, he looks like a look, plague doctor. He, <laughs> he does. He is. <laughs> cool, I love that. I think this character yeah, looks very cool. <laughs> and other research I did, I found out that this character is originally from Chicago. Is that like usually, is that all of his comic book um, versions? Or is that just like a certain, um, yeah era i don't know uh but as far as his backstory goes what is kind of interesting is that mark specter is one of the few canonically jewish characters in in marvel comics in particular he's like his family was like orthodox he's the son of a rabbi so he's the son of a rabbi who is now the priest of an egyptian moon revenge god and uh Lee just confirmed for us that Kansu, the canonical, actual, real-world Kansu, is indeed uh, the god of the Egyptian god of the moon. Um, so he's the son of a rabbi who becomes a priest for an ancient Egyptian moon god. And, you know, in between was a mercenary and, like, just kind of a general all-around bad guy. And now he fights werewolves and vampires and stuff. There's a lot of layers to Moon Knight. I just still have so many questions about this show, which I don't hate. Like, I like, it's so refreshing going into a Marvel project and not knowing so much. We've talked about this before on Marvel Standom, where we're at a, a point in the MCU where even if, like, Alec and myself, you haven't read the comics, um, if you've been watching the MCU since the beginning, you have this knowledge. Um, you're a nerd within the MCU. Um and so when there's a new character that comes in that it isn't obvious how they're connected or what role they're going to play, for me, that's really exciting within this franchise that has become more predictable, for better and worse, maybe, as, as it's gone on. I was going to say, I love the vibes in this trailer, too. Um, 
because we we talked about this briefly i think during the black widow era um that since marvel and superheroes in general are so such a pervasive force in theaters and on television now it feels like they've almost adopted an extra level of responsibility to do to be more diverse in like their genres and their tones at this trailer in particular uh until that hero shot of the end at the end with oscar isaac and moon knight costume uh you would have no idea that you were watching a marvel trailer it looks like an m night Shyamalan psychological thriller or something right up until the end so i'm excited for that and it's also just straight up spooky did any of you watch legion because i didn't but <laughs> as someone who didn't watch legion i was like huh i wonder if this reminds people who watch legion of legion <laughs> i watched uh, I legion this I is did watch legion. Yeah, okay. <laughs> nothing reminds me of legion <laughs> no <laughs> No one's dancing cool, cool. for a start. If they were dancing around, maybe, um, yeah, that, that would remind me of Legion. Well, I think there's two things to talk about here. One is the the spooky vibes, and the other thing is the connections, like or the possible connections to the wider MCU and what you know what this show could be setting up. Kirsty, I think you're better positioned to talk about you know uh, Mark Spector's place in the MCU or potential place in the MCU and what we think this show is kind of seeding. Because all of these shows have kind of had their own little um, road to tend. You know, like, like Falcon and Winter Soldier is kind of part of like what Black Widow was setting up with like the geopolitical implications of the, of the MCU. And WandaVision and Loki, you know, kind of are, we're laying the groundwork for stuff that we saw in No Way Home and that we're gonna see again in Doctor Strange and the Multiverse of Madness. Moon Knight is something very different. You know, so Kirsty, why don't you why don't you take a shot at this and, and help educate everybody? Well, Moon Knight's Marvel's first proper supernatural superhero project, and there will be more to come. There's a Blade reboot, you know, on the way. There's a Werewolf by Night special coming, hopefully later this year. And I think that a, a lot of these will be connected. We could probably see Dane Whitman come back. Potentially, there could be a, a team up in this future. Um, there's Marvel Knights, which brings together Daredevil, uh, Black Widow, Moon Knight and Shang-Chi. Um, so that's a potential for the future as well. Bringing Moon Knight in makes sense if you're going down a dark path, which it, which it seems like the MCU is in phase four. You know, a lot of the shows have been quite depressing <laughs> you know, WandaVision's been quite emotional and Loki's been quite depressing and, and now we have uh, Moon Knight which is somebody who is, you know, in most of his stories we we catch him at the start at rock bottom and he always has to claw his way back up into the light and I think that this could possibly be another story where we see that. Um, Doctor Strange in the Multiverse of Madness, also another possibility for Moon Knight to pop up there. Um, but in terms of the, fu the future and of the central villain of Phase 4, who we believe is going to be Kang, we've just been introduced to a version of Moon Knight in ancient Egypt, which was a variant of Ravona Renslayer from the, uh, that we just met in the Loki show. So she, she is now canonically in some area, a former Moon Knight. There could be a reason for bringing this in because it's completely out of left field. Like, I don't think any of us were expecting to read that. Um, so, you know, who knows? There could be some Kang connections coming in in the future too. And he has past connections with Kang, but it's too complex to get into here. The whole spooky vibe is the thing that I hope they lean into the most on this show, because first of all, it is it is the thing that is just going to set the show the furthest apart from everything else. It's the thing that I really wish they had done with Doctor Strange right out of the gate. And, you know, back in the day when the Marvel Netflix shows were still a thing, I always expected Moon Knight was going to be part of whatever the next batch of those shows would have ended up being. You know, Moon Knight just seemed like the next logical addition, particularly if you read like this one uh, run from like 2006 or so written by a guy named Charlie Houston, which is like super like violent and nasty and really shows a kind of grizzled, ugly, tired, cynical side of Mark Spector and his world, you know. 
Um, so if we're not going to get that, if we're not going to get something that kind of really feels like that, to me, the next best thing is to finally see what werewolves and vampires are like in the Marvel Cinematic Universe. I mean, this is a character who first appeared in a book called Werewolf by Night, you know, like, like Marvel published a tremendously successful werewolf comic book that ran for like 150 issues or something like like with a character who had the unfortunate name of Jack Russell, like a guy named Jack <laughs> Russell turned into a like terrier faced werewolf. I kid you not, folks. Oh, this so sounds I, amazing. <laughs> but, the book, but the book is really good. Like the book is genuinely good. And like two years into the run, they introduced Moon Knight, who was this like mercenary who was brought in to take down Werewolf by Night. And it makes sense because what better foe for a werewolf than a guy clad in like silver armor with a with a moon theme to him? And of course, like, you know, Moon Knight eventually became a fan favorite after a few guest appearances in other books and had a whole bunch of solo series on his own. But like the thing that people always throw at Moon Knight is that, oh, he's just Marvel's Batman, right? He's got an amazing costume. He's got like a team of helpers. He's got all these cool gadgets and stuff like that, but he's not. And, it, you know, it, it, there's a lot more going on there. But I think what recent writers have done a really good job of doing is lean into the fact that, no, this is the guy who protects the people who travel by night. You know, this is the guy who has to deal with the like kind of horrific corners of the MCU that you don't usually see during the daytime. And that final shot in this trailer, I mean, that's pretty clearly a werewolf he's beating the crap out of, right? Like I'm not imagining <laughs> that. Like <laughs> I don't know that I got that, but I don't I think like I don't have the context to get it. And I'm very excited that it might be a werewolf. <laughs> I think it is well I, I uh, I'm pretty sure in the original teaser footage that they released a couple months ago, that that same shot, that that was not a werewolf. That, that was not clearly a werewolf. Look at that. That is a werewolf, folks. <laughs> I'm like, can someone please make a it. GIF of Mike just saying, <laughs> look at that. That is a werewolf. <laughs> Straight up wailing on Remus Lupin. I mean, yeah, I don't I'm not, like, I don't not see werewolf. <laughs> it better, it just better not be Jack Russell. I'll be very upset. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not sure about the werewolf. This is such a great moment of Moon Knight fighting style, though. He is just relentless and visceral. Um, it's because, <laughs> I do think it's because he's got quite a high pain tolerance. Um, and also because whenever he dies, Konshu just revives him. So he, he's, he just seems to just go for it with every fight. And he's really responsive and gets straight in there. I do think that there's there's, a, there's an element of when in the comics like Taskmaster would just rather not copy um, Moon Knight's moves because he says, you know, you'd rather take a punch or a kick or a stab than block one or dodge one. And that's what Moon Knight is like as a fighter. So I'm really intrigued to see more of this in the MCU. I know they probably can't go too dark on Disney Plus, but, you know, if Moon we get Knight's more moments like that, I'd, I'd be very happy. Moon Knight seems so alone in this trailer. <laughs> um, is there, I mean, we have this person, the voice on the phone, but mm. is he going to have any friends? <laughs> I mean, he does have friends in the comics. As far as Moon Knight has friends, no one tends to trust him because he's so, well, quite frankly, a bit crazy, you know. Mm. <laughs> no one knows what he's going to do next. So, But he has uh, Crawley, who is... I think it's like sort of a flowery talking homeless person that he is friends with. And then there's Frenchie, who was another mercenary that he used to work with, uh, who was kind of around when he died the first time. Um, and then he has Marlene, who's this long term love interest. Okay. But we can't well, miss any of them. <laughs> I watched the trailer with um, closed captioning, and the, the woman on the phone was called Layla. Yes. Oh, interesting. But I don't remember anyone called Layla from the comics. <laughs> that doesn't mean she doesn't exist. I have a terrible memory. But um, yeah, I can't remember anyone. Can you, Mike? No, no, that doesn't ring a bell at all. I just assumed it was Marlene. Mm. Marlela. And the woman at the museum. <laughs> <laughs> the woman at the museum who has a English accent that's about as bad as Oscar Isaac's. Um, 
even though I think she's actually British. <laughs> called Donna. I love Alec bringing all these closed captioned insights. <laughs> <laughs> That's <laughs> my weekly uh, segment is closed caption corner. <laughs> so then there's the matter of the villains on the show, right? And um, Moon Knight is not really known for having like the most spectacular rogues gallery. You know, there's there's Bushmaster who is kind of like the equivalent of his Joker. It's a character that just like plagues him all through his career. Um, I don't know that we're getting that character on this show at all, which is probably a good thing. Um, like there's all kinds of like weird issues with that character, not the least of which in one series, Mark cut his face off and like carried it around with him for a while. So like, like I don't a hanky. Really see that. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> this is who we're dealing with, guys. Come on. Yeah, Moon Knight rules. We do have the great Ethan Hawke uh, as a character that, believe it or not, I had never heard of until this trailer. And then, you know, right before we started recording this today, we got the tragic news broke that uh, another actor on this show who's playing one of the villains, a, a character named Midnight Man, uh, the actor uh, Gaspard Ulliel, uh tragically died suddenly in a skiing accident. I don't know if it was earlier today or yesterday. Uh, so that certainly casts a cloud over this show. Uh, and I'm sure that, uh, you know, whatever role Midnight Man has to play in this show, uh, I, I know that Disney will and Marvel Studios will find a way to kind of uh, pay tribute to this this fellow's contributions. But, you know, it was, it was really awful news. He was 37 years old and, uh, you know, to see somebody uh, especially right at the start of, uh, you know, a, a career like this, a show that can really kind of jumpstart somebody's career. It hurts to see, and we're really sorry to see that, and, uh, and our hearts go out to his family and friends. Um, so, you know, I guess, I don't know how else to transition this back into our usual Marvel standom stuff, um, but... Let's just keep this guy in mind, especially when we're when we're watching his performance when the show comes in in March. Kirsty, what can you tell us about Ethan Hawke's uh, Arthur Harrow? Uh, Arthur Harrow was in 1985's Moon Knight: Fists of Conchu Two. He was a respected scientist researching pain theory, who was secretly using data from some like disturbing experiments carried out by the Nazis at Auschwitz. And he ultimately escaped after his encounter with Moon Knight in that issue and was never seen again. Um, this issue, as far as I know, is not available to read on Marvel Unlimited. And it is a tough one to get hold of. Um, it's a very random an antagonist pick from Marvel. Uh, I think we, we might see a case of this villain, Arthur Harrow, being mashed up with another villain from uh, Moon Knight's past, but we shall have to see. First of all, I love Ethan Hawke. Ethan Hawke was my choice to play Doctor Strange, but unfortunately mm. uh, I lost my job as Marvel Studios casting director. <laughs> um, so I'm just glad to see Ethan Hawke finally join the MCU in some capacity. Um, I was kind of hoping that he was going to be Dracula uh, because Ethan Hawke has like like a very particular kind of set of features that makes him look like uh, Gene Kalan's Dracula. Like there's an awesome Tomb of Dracula uh, ongoing series from Marvel Comics and that's where Blade was introduced. So I was hoping maybe this was gonna be our back door into like an MCU Dracula and that was how, you know, they would bring Blade in and everything else, but whatever. It's Ethan Hawke. I'm psyched to see him like in, in a big part like this, in a big genre role like this. I don't care that I haven't read the comic. This is one time that I'm just happy, just kind of happy to be there, you know? I will say that, I don't know if you've seen this movie, Mike, but Ethan Hawke plays a vampire in Daybreakers. Oh, yes. <laughs> Maybe he's played a vampire another time too, but that is a good movie and he plays a great vampire. And he's got good horror chops. He was in Sinister, right? Like, mm -hmm. so... Uh, yeah, he's a good yeah. actor vampire character or otherwise i think when i was in my sort of teens 20s i had myself convinced that ethan hawke was just a very serious man who would perhaps only take sort of passion projects and stuff and as i've grown up i've seen him in like daybreakers and stuff like that and i was like no i think if it's fun enough he will just go for it or maybe but he I... has a passion for daybreakers <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. I think it took a lot of convincing to get him in Sinister, from what I recall. It was a, mm. it was a period of um, Scott Derrickson, the director, isn't it? 
Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Um, that he, Another Doctor Strange he connection. Yeah. yeah. I'm telling you, folks. Like <laughs> Ethan Hawke. Mike's like, I had it all Strange. mapped out. <laughs> <laughs> Well, you know, I mean, Dracula and Doctor Strange uh, disappointment aside, I feel this kind of feels like the right Marvel role for Ethan Hawke because the character is obscure enough that they can, he's kind of a blank slate. And Ethan Hawke in a previous interview kind of compared him to David Koresh. And then we see the culty vibes from this trailer. So, I mean, if there were an actor out there who could like reasonably start a cult within the MCU, Ethan Hawke feels like just a terrific choice. His hair is perfect here. And by perfect, yeah. I mean terrible. <laughs> it's perfect. <laughs> is that a wig he's wearing? I think that's his hair. His, he, his really? hair is usually long. But he just looks weird because he doesn't have a beard. He usually has the beard. So one thing that folks have been asking us to do at Marvel Standom for a long time is to actually do some, uh, some comics recommendations. Because I know sometimes... Uh, Kirsty and I can get out into the weeds with uh, with some of the, the cool comics knowledge and stuff. And people are always asking me, like, you know, if I like the movies or I like the TV shows, what should I read? Because it is so overwhelming. There's so much comic stuff out there. Even a character like Moon Knight, who is kind of like a B-list, C-list Marvel character, still has like 45 years worth of comics to sift through. And it's overwhelming. Kirsten has read almost all of them. <laughs> and so, Kirsty, uh, what would you recommend? What What do you think is a good starting point for folks if they want to check out some Moon Knight comics before this show premieres in March? Oh, gosh. There are so many options. And really, it's based on what you would like personally like to get out of a comic. You know, if you're looking for a perfect blend of story and art, you probably can't beat Jeff Lemire and and is it Greg Smallwood's, um, yeah, Moon Knight. I just think that is a great sort of story that you can get right into, get to the heart of Moonlight. And if you never read another Moonlight comic, you know, that's okay. Um, in this story, Mark Spector is imprisoned in a, like an asylum. Um, he's getting electroshock therapy and being beaten by the wardens of the hospital. And he has to try and work out whether he is actually crazy or if all of this stuff has happened to him and he does, you know, struggle with dissociative identity disorder. So that's definitely one to get into. Um, if you're looking for the, the grittier, darker sort of Batman-ish vibe of Moon Knight, then the one that Mike mentioned before, Charlie Houston's Moon Knight, is um, probably up... For you. Um, it is a darker series, so if that's your bag, it's a fine option. Um, in that story, I think Mark thinks he's been abandoned by Konshu and he loses his support system, sinks into a deep depression, gets addicted to pills, and is just generally a huge asshole. Um, a lot of this story is just is just about him getting over himself and clawing his way back, um, despite being constantly tormented. If that sounds like a fun time, <laughs> oh, Houston's comic, go for it. Um, there's also the Warren Ellis run, which a lot of people are a fan on, kind of more of a detective story uh, that kind of reimagines Moon Knight as Mister Knight. You may have seen Moon Knight in a sort of white suit. Um, that's Ellis's. Um, that's Alice's Moon Knight. Um, there's more street level weird investigations there. So if that's your thing, more of a detective Moon Knight, go for that one. Um, there's also, and this is an unpopular pick, but Brian Michael Bendis. I have as many problems with Bendis as the next comic fan. Um, but in this comic, I think it might be a little bit more accessible for people who only know the MCU and X-Men movies purely because Mark's alternate identities here are Captain America, Spider-Man and Wolverine and not the other identities from his usual comics. Um, this series also features a romantic sort of entanglement with Echo, who we just met in Hawkeye. So this could be more accessible if you're only familiar with like the MCU because there's, there's more to glom on to that you already know. The story revolves around a stolen Ultron head too. So they're all basic okay, elements. Okay, sold. That you... <laughs> yes. <laughs> but at the end of the day, it is Brian Michael Bendis. Everyone talks like Bendis. And um, yeah, the, the dialogue isn't the best. I will say that 
that are you, are you, are you coming to its defense? <laughs> no, well, yeah, I will say it has amazing <laughs> Alex Maleev art. And Bendis is never, yes. ever, ever better than when he is paired with Alex Maleev on art. Like, that is one of the great uh, Marvel creative pairings of the 21st century. You know, they kind of really made made a name for themselves on, uh, on Bendis' extended Daredevil run. But, like, whenever it's Bendis and Maleev together it's cool like it's definitely like it's it's a step up and it's as cool as street level marvel stuff is ever gonna look i think, anyway. I, think I found i think i found my first moon knight um <laughs> comic this is also set in la this run so it's more of a more of that vibe than the the new york based ones which tend to be a bit darker i'd also just like to point out that the current run is uh is fantastic there's a brand new moon knight series by Jed McKay and Alessandro Capuccio. And that book is awesome. Jed McKay is a writer who's only recently been on my radar. And between this book and uh, The Death of Doctor Strange, which is about to release its fifth and final issue in a couple of weeks, this dude is legit. And I'm really, really digging what he is putting down in the Marvel, in the Marvel Comics world at the moment. And uh, what I'm hoping is that, like, this is another one that is kind of blending all of these different elements of Moon Knight. There's a lot of the Mr. Knight, you know, white suit elements to it. But then there's also the more traditional taped and cowled Moon Knight. And they've brought in, like, the werewolf and vampire elements. And, like, now his whole thing is he's kind of set up, like, like kind of like a church, kind of like a church of Kanshu in, in a bad part of town. And he, you know, people come to him with their problems and, and he's like, okay, I'm here to protect the people who, you know, you know, who are out there trying to make a living at night. He ends up with like, kind of like a, like a vampire friend, like, um, you know, somebody that had been unwillingly turned into a vampire. And now she's kind of like helping him out slash barely tolerating his bullshit, uh, and it's really, really cool. It's a good book. It's a, it's a perfectly reasonable entry point. I think there's three issues on Marvel Unlimited so far, and like five or six issues have hit the, you know, have hit the stands physically at the moment. It's a good book, and Jed McKay is a writer to watch. I definitely come at these Marvel TV series from a TV perspective, which by that I mean that I look at who the head writer or showrunner is and who the director is. Or directors are and this Moon Knight seems to be following this Marvel TV trend on Disney Plus where there's they're getting head writers notably notably not showrunners um, and directors who have less um, experience they still have done you know a fair amount but they're giving opportunities to people who maybe haven't um, run a show before or um, directed a project like this. Um, the person who's the head writer for Moon Knight is Jeremy Slater, who I've actually not seen anything else he's worked on. And I'm not as excited about him as I was about Jonathan Igla, who um, did Hawkeye and I think had some really interesting credits um, previously. But he co-wrote the 2015 Fantastic Four movie, which is not necessarily his fault. <laughs> Um, and also the first episode of Umbrella Academy and also show ran the Fox TV show, The Exorcist. So I haven't seen any, any of those things. Um, but yeah, I'm just curious to see another, um, I guess, yeah, someone who I don't know a lot about as a storyteller get an opportunity like this. Um, there's also an Egyptian director, Mohamed Diab, who is coming on. He's leading the directing team. And I've not seen any of his work either, um, as he's mostly worked in Egypt. But it's cool to see, um, yeah, Marvel giving giving these chances to to different people. I know that Justin Benson and Aaron Moorhead have done a couple of uh, directed a couple of those Moon Knight episodes too. Um, they're a fantastic directing duo. Um, if you've seen The Endless, that was them. Spring, another one. They actually did a recent movie with Anthony Mackie. So again, we're we're back to the Marvel connection, but um, I can't remember what it was called. I want to say Euphoria, but it's not. <laughs> was that anyone... Synchronic? Synchronic, thank you. Oh my God, my memory. I can see um... why you confused those two. <laughs> 
I think was it Jamie Dornan in that one as well with Mackie? I can't I remember. So. All I can remember is Mackie and he had a dog. <laughs> and that's and that's it. And he was sort of time travelling. But um yeah, that's probably the not the best of their movies. Check out the endless if you wanna see the very best but i'm looking forward to this combo it sounds like an interesting team on this one as well i feel like oscar isaac's had a lot of input into it as you would if you'd had perhaps a bad experience <laughs> under disney before uh, that might be something that you request going back in but who knows i think um probably his problems were more with lucasfilm than with disney otherwise we might not have seen him return for this at all well i also want to note that he was not given the best situation in X-Men Apocalypse. <laughs> so that might also be on his mind. That's the understatement of the of the very young year I, that is 2022, Katie. I didn't dislike that film as, as much as most people, but oh, he's such a dynamic actor. He's so charismatic. I'm still not over what they did to him in that movie. <laughs> he's amazing, but he was miscast as Apocalypse. I mean, he also, you just can't see his face or hear his voice, which puts real limitations on an actor. <laughs> yeah, you couldn't cast the handsomest man alive and then immediately put him under like four pounds of uh, prosthetic. Um, congrats, though, to Oscar Isaac for completing the Marvel Trinity. He did Apocalypse with Fox, Into the Spider-Verse with Sony, and now Moon Knight with uh, Marvel Disney. Congratulations, sir. Yeah. <laughs> um, I also, I'm always curious about the structure of these things, and I believe this is going to be six episodes, which um, seems to be a lot of the Marvel TV shows. Um, I think WandaVision and What If were the only ones that were slightly longer at nine episodes. So, they were half hours. Oh, good point. Yeah, so... You know, these are TV shows, but they, I don't know, we're living in this time of like the blurring of lines between what is a movie and what is a TV show or where those formats like overlap or not. And yeah, I feel like this is real like mini series or I guess British TV uh, rules. <laughs> um, don't you mean British TV? Kate? British. <laughs> <laughs> Anybody have any final thoughts on Moon Knight, Mark Spector, Oscar Isaac, vampires and werewolves in the MCU or anything else before we go? Ooh, any thoughts on vampires? <laughs> no. <laughs> I think I'm good for now. <laughs> I am just going to continue manifesting Dracula in the MCU. Like, I really, really, really need to see MCU Dracula. This is something that has to happen. It has to happen before they introduce the X-Men so that eventually the X-Men can fight Dracula on screen like they have in the <laughs> comics. Yes, that is a thing that has actually happened. Like, I need this. I need Dracula in the MCU. I need him before Blade. I'm too impatient to wait for Blade. <laughs> like, hopefully... Like, I didn't know this movies. about you, Mike. <laughs> oh, man, I'm a, big, I'm a big Dracula stan. Like, we'll do Dracula stand in October. It's great. Like, but I just particularly like Marvel Dracula. Like, the fact that Dracula is a character in the Marvel Universe delights me to no end so okay yeah. so i've never read any marvel dracula comics that i'm aware of what is he like in the mcu is he just very traditionally dracula with the <laughs> the cape and the yes the accent <laughs> yes okay so it's the whole cliche yes okay no i'll have because to how else like how else is dracula gonna fight superheroes unless like he is like the the perfect pop culture Dracula, you know? <laughs> okay, I do have one more question. Yes. Okay. Is Mephisto going to be in this? Uh, I mean, of course. <laughs> <laughs> I'm never going to live that down from WandaVision, folks. It's never I've learned happen. to anticipate this as a possible, <laughs> not a real possibility, but there's going to be theories about it, so I'm ready. <laughs> Kirsten, with your permission, I'm going to wrap this up. You're the Moon Knight expert, so you're the only one who could tell us when we're done or not. I think we're done for now. We can, Christy uh, could hold us hostage. <laughs> we can revisit the Moon Knight. In fact, yeah, we will, meet, we will revisit Moon Knight. We're going to do a show every week after these episodes, right? So we're going to come back to Moon Knight at least six more times. Um, and I hope that you're all looking forward to it as much as I am. <laughs> All right, well, that is a wrap on a surprisingly glitch-free first episode of Marvel Stand Alive. 
Thank you so much to everybody who tuned in. We really appreciate it. You'll also, if you came in late, you'll be able to watch this episode on YouTube starting tomorrow or Friday. Tomorrow or Friday. We're also going to put the audio from this up on Spotify. Just if you don't want to look at my face anymore, who can blame you? Um, make sure you're following us on Twitter. We're at Marvel Standom. Make sure you're following all of these fine people on Twitter. You can see us right there in, uh, in the chat windows there. Um, make sure you are following our web home of denofgeek.com. We are Den of Geek US and at Den of Geek on Twitter and Instagram and Facebook. We are everywhere. And uh, thank you so much to our producer, Andrew Halley, who made this a reality and made it look so good and kept us on track and actually kept this thing from glitching out the whole time. I can't believe we actually pulled it off. <laughs> thank you to our chat moderators, Lee Parham and Jessica Koinock. And once again, thanks to all you. Stand together, folks. We'll see you soon. Look at that. That is a werewolf, folks. 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 Look at that. That is a werewolf, folks.